Thanks, Zoom lady. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, probably don't know what to expect, <laughs> me, me neither, honestly. Uh, today will be actually mostly a physics lecture, you'll be surprised. Um, so, uh, but next week, if you come back, if I deserve uh, this honor that you come back, or at least if you're hungry for more lunch, uh, then there'll be more of a, uh, what, what our papers really and how do we write them and how do we read them kind of discussion and also with a lot of back and forth. But today I prepared a lot of physics material and my idea is that um, this will get us all on the same, not on the same page, but in the same, you know, on the same around the same table where we look at some examples and we just sort of analyze them. Right? And of course, I will be biasing you heavily by my perception of these papers so just so you know but uh that will be basically the the time today and uh, next week will be will be quite different so let's see which way we go here yeah so i um have my own group at the university of pittsburgh i'm an experimental um quantum transport person so we have dilution fridges um, in the lab, and uh, here you can find my info. This is some, some of my students. Um, and uh, where this idea to, to have this uh, couple lectures mini course came from is really, um, you know, my students, like yourself, are excited about science and physics, and they read papers, and they share links on our Slack and whatnot. And, and they want to talk about them. Maybe they want to say, "Oh, let's let's maybe do something like this, like this experiment that, that these guys did." And, and you know, occasionally it works really well. Like when my student recently saw the spin diode work coming out. And, oh, sorry, superconducting supercurrent diode. And you know, <laughs> we found it in our data as well. And pretty much everyone else in the world doing Josephson junctions did the same. But okay, uh, other times. Uh, my student comes to me and says, oh, this great paper, right? And I'm like, no. <laughs> you know? And then I, I said no so many times that my student said, well, how can we, you know, what can we read? What can we trust? Which papers should we read? And, uh, you know, at some point I was making lists like, okay, read these papers. You know, don't read these papers. And, um, and then some kind of principles started emerging and, uh, this is, this is what um, uh, I'm going to try to discuss here. Um, and like I said, it will be mostly uh, examples all connected today, but I want to just uh, make some statements at the beginning, which you may disagree with, and I'll be happy to discuss with you because you can complete my or compete with my um, view here. But um, I think this is not very... Uh, Controversial, but a different way of thinking about things. Uh, who wrote papers already? So mo most of you, maybe writing or soon to soon soon writing papers. So we we all we all went through this, and uh, so this is a physical review letters paper that I wrote as a postdoc. I'm uh, very proud of it, um, and uh, it's legit. <laughs> you know, as far as uh, you know, um, I believe it's legit. Nevertheless, um, let's look at what it is. So it's four pages. It's uh, one, two, three, four figures. Um, it's from a while ago, like uh, ten plus years ago. So before we started sharing all data and sharing the digital files of the data. Um, so this is it. This is all you got. Th these four pages, uh, these are uh, JPEGs uh, of data that uh, we selected out of a lot of data, right? And uh, we made some claims in this paper that in this case, uh, there is a signal, this checkerboard pattern, it's a dramatic signal as a function of two parameters, which are two gate voltages on two electrodes. Um, and there is a unique interpretation of this pattern in terms of uh, generation of spin current that flows in a semiconductor. 
That's what the paper is about. Uh, <clears throat> even here, uh, last figure here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there is a similar pattern, kind of a checkerboard, red and dark, uh, yellow and dark, like here, uh, due to another effect, not due to the spin currents that the paper is about, but due to thermoelectric effect. So the same device, same measurement, similar looking signal, uh, completely different effect. So that we'll be talking about these kind of things today. So you, you, you're shown a dramatic pattern, but it could have another explanation. By the way, just as an anecdote, uh, initially this paper was all about this because this is, we first we thought this was a spin signal and this happens at zero magnetic field. So this is a, it would have been a revolution in physics that at zero field without anything magnetic in this system, there are no ferromagnets or any magnetic materials. Uh, we are spontaneously breaking spin up, spin down symmetry and creating a spin current at zero field. So it was actually written up. I wrote it in the nature format and I was ready to go. We, we asked some distinguished people that is it, you know, is it legit? Does it seem legit to you? And they, one was like, yeah, absolutely. Why is it not you know, published yet? And the other one was like, ah. But the last moment before submitting, I read a paper where it talked about the Peltier effect. You know, anybody heard Peltier effect? It's from the you know, 1700s. <laughs> it's from 1700s. And, and it perfectly explains this signal. So this became from nature paper to a figure four of this PRL. And uh, you know, it was all about this um, less controversial thing. That... OK, so um, yeah, the, so. Uh, I gave a couple talks about this uh, and we stopped, you know, never submitted the draft. Okay. So basically um, I could have written that, I could have sent that paper to nature and, and it, chances are it would have been published. Chances are very high. You know, even if the referee is maybe one referee is a little skeptical, but we write some responses to them with uh, sort of uh, explanations and yeah. I can see it being published. Um, and so uh, this is why, uh, and this is what essentially the paper is. Uh, there's more and more of this happening, but really in our community, which is a, sort of the quantum foundry, condensed matter physics, material science, engineering community, not much of this is happening yet, where you can you know, go deeper into this beyond these figures and see some of the other data and so, you know, rerun the code, replot the data, at least change the colors here and see what we are, is anything hidden or not. Uh, <clears throat> without this, um, you basically just have these four pages. And uh, my, my argument is it's really not enough to, to conclude about any paper. So strictly speaking, you can't tell. You can't tell that it's legit. And, I want this to be a starting point for us. <laughs> so this cannot tell the paper is legit, right? So you, you know, and then we, we discuss from that point. Um, now, um, I, you know, you don't have to agree with me on this. You, you can have your own and you can argue with me or just say, I, I think differently. Uh, that's fine. But I, I just want to propose this starting point. And with this as a starting point, um, the next question is, so, okay, but still these, we publish papers, we all write them, and uh, this is what we do. We, we make a PDF file with JPEG images. Um, and so how do we um, know which one to read, which one to trust? So these are the things that typically uh, you can go by. So, certainly this is what I use, or at least used to use, and with more experience maybe, I go more towards you know what I think about it, but um, but certainly I look at the names. Who are the authors? Which group is it? A group that is that I like, that I trust, that is famous, right? Uh, which journal, right? Is it in Nature or is it in uh, something else? Uh, you know, a smaller journal. Um, is the journal good? Because some people say, okay, nature is prestigious, but it's 
not good, you know, it's it's overhyped, or you know, there's criticisms of nature, I mean, justified or not. But and then there are other journals where people say they're good. So um, who knows physical review letters, for example, like the paper I just show, right? Is that a good journal? Generally, they say yes. <laughs> yeah, people say yes. I, I actually ran a poll on my Twitter, and 80% of the respondents said yes, and there was something like 500 votes, if I remember correctly. So, by and large, physicists believe physical review letters is a good journal, right? So, which means the referees there do a good job, the editors do a good job, right? And so, generally, you read a PRL and you can trust it. I actually disagree with that. I think it's a terrible journal, but. <laughs> um, you know, this is what a lot of the people believe. So then you can also ask somebody like your advisor or a postdoc in your group or just another student. So have you seen that paper? What do you think? Uh, and then chances are those people will go by these things as well and not actually by anything else. Um, and so today, yeah, I want to emphasize um, these uh, pathways more than than these pathways, right? So the, the, the highlighted pathways. Um, and um, in particular, if you talk to somebody, uh, listen to the argument, not sort of just, oh, yeah, I think looks okay. Or, yeah, so, you know, even, uh, even the journals ask referees to substantiate their, you know, is it good or bad? Why? Explain why. Right? So listen to the arguments. And also, um, Maybe we can develop together some basic principles for how we could evaluate uh, just any paper. But maybe that's too ambitious. But we'll we'll try to get there through some examples. Okay. So this is, because this is a, this is a discussion of some research that's maybe not fully trustworthy in essence, or at least maybe the research is okay, but it has another interpretation. So this this kind of uh, area, um, uh, a lot of things get mixed in uh, into these discussions, and people jump tend to jump from one to the other, uh, like I just did. I'm jumping from what the journals do to what the papers are about to what the colleagues do, um, right? And um, mostly for the sake of time, uh, I I acknowledge that all of these are related topics. These are all related. Where, uh, for instance. Uh, why is the paper not reliable? Is it uh, mistaken? People made an honest mistake in this paper or didn't think of another explanation or is it malicious? They actually fabricated parts of their research. Uh, that's obviously important, but let's put it aside. Let's not talk about this today. We can talk about it. I'm happy to talk about this with you, but maybe after the course or towards the end, if you like. Uh, same about uh, a lot of the times people disagree with placement, like say, why is this, why is this in nature, right? This is, this is, this has been done before. This is not interesting, right? So this get mixed in um, with the other things. And I, I, again, I don't want to talk about impact. We, we sort of uh, set the impact of all work to 100%. Uh, so this, we don't distinguish uh, any, any claim you make. Okay, let's let's agree that it's important and not try to uh, scale scale it. Then another thing people always often often say is, well, they are out for our money. They charge us for fees to publish. They charge subscriptions. They are driven by this, and this is the root cause of it. So again, not about the causes of it, of why where the money goes. I actually personally think that. Uh, it's okay to pay people money for facilitating some of this, you know, peer review and some of the elements of this uh, process and, you know, whichever way we can get them money, maybe not too much money, but um, it's okay for people to get paid for this. And so some kind of business model, I don't know, donation, subscription, fee, whatever, uh, it's, it's all good. Of course, excessive, uh, nothing excessive is good. So then uh, government policy or university policy, how this is all regulated, leave it aside. And another one of all the types of problems, uh, plagiarism is actually the most common one that people get um, into trouble about, but it's less relevant in these kind of natural science physics papers, right? Because we, the text is uh, not the, the main essence here. 
uh, of our work, right? Uh, sometimes there is higher level plagiarism, like you you saw somebody doing this work, like as a referee, for instance, and you delayed the paper and you took it and you redid it quickly and published under your own name. So this is technically plagiarism, but again, uh, we're not about talking about this. So just if you did a good job and did it correctly and you plagiarized, uh, for the purposes of this course, it's okay. Now, finally, there are some famous um, uh, scandals in, surrounding my area and uh, in condensed matter physics. So I don't know if you've heard of any uh, retractions uh, that happened recently. A uh, high temp high room temperature superconductor. Anyone been to March meeting? Or yes. Heard anything there? Yeah. Exactly right. So that's. Um, I actually not wasn't planning to prepare anything about this for you, but if you want to talk about it, we can. Uh, this is the same group that you also work for, like you uh, give them comments and they retract their paper. I didn't much for that paper personally, but there is another professor, James Hamlin, who recorded a, a talk online on YouTube, uh, which uh, goes through all the problems pretty much. So if you're interested, you can watch that. I gave comments to uh, some other attractions. So my field of research is Majorana fermions. And um, uh, I was part of the team that wrote the, the one of the first experimental papers in that area, but 2012, uh, which we later realized is probably uh, was not a disc most certainly not a discovery of Majorana fermions, but we claim it was part of the natural uh, scientific process, like learning from mistakes. Uh, but then uh, more papers got retracted in that area, and also because of the problems I and my friend uh, Vincent Maurick found. Uh, so I was involved heavily in those retractions, and there were some other, like a UCLA chiral Majorana retraction. So um, basically, I don't want to talk about that for the following reason. Um, there is a lot of information online about that and you may have heard something and you may have some opinions about it, at least some of you, maybe not. Um, but I, I wanted to avoid um, sort of talking again about this. Um, and I wanted to give you a completely fresh piece of physics that chances are you haven't heard about or haven't thought deeply about. And so with this sort of an un uninitiated uh, niche topic, um, talk through some of the things that happen uh, when you try to figure out if the paper is legit or not. So um, this is basically what we're going to talk about, Shapiro steps. So uh, do you know, Shap anyone know Shapiro steps? Your postdoc? <laughs> I do Joseph's injections. You do Joseph's injections. Okay. So, so you will be my uh, check, my reality check here. Um, yeah, so, um, but I calculated that at UCSB, there won't be too many people that know Shapiro steps. Uh, and so I figured I'm going to talk about this because I've been after these steps for a good 20 years. And I will just talk about my own experience with various Shapiro step claims, including some of my own papers. And we're just gonna, you know, take a look, take a look at what's happening in this area. And, uh, you know, I'll try to make some generalizing comments or you welcome to, to make them yourself, uh, what you think about each paper. And maybe at the end, because uh, I think I have most of your emails, I will send you the list of papers we talked about today. So you could have a, a better look at them or feel free to, you know, browse and, and see. Um, so let me first explain the physics, right? I told you it will be a physics lecture basically today. And uh, so the, the effect itself is very much uh, real and uh, has been observed in uh, many, many, many experiments going back to 1960s. Um, and it comes from a fundamental uh, relationship, which is this relationship, which is a second Josephson relationship. Second Josephson relationship. The first Josephson relationship is this relationship. It's a relationship between a supercurrent flowing without resistance, right, across a Josephson junction, which is uh, two superconductors with a barrier. So there is a non-superconducting part in between two superconductors, but supercurrent can flow 
due to this Jolison effect. And uh, it's a phase coherent effect. So there are two wave functions in the two superconductors and they can have a phase difference of phi. So wave function is just a complex number, uh, amplitude and phase. So one phase here and another phase here. And depending on the relative phase, the phase difference, which is phi, uh, this supercurrent that flows through the junction changes. And uh, the, the simplest one is sinusoidal. So that's what Josephson derived for a tunnel junction. And that's the first one. And the second one is that if the phase difference keeps winding, if one of the phases keeps rotating, then a voltage develops across this junction. So the time dependent gives you voltage and static gives you dissipation with zero voltage supercurrent. And this is depicted by the blue curve here. So there is a regime here with zero voltage up to a critical current, no voltage. We are on this business basically. And then above a critical current, there is a kind of a switch and then it behaves like a resistor or asymptotically approaching a resistor. And this resistance is called normal state resistance. And we are in, well, this equation starts to work. So when we are in this regime somewhere here, the phase difference starts to wind. So these are the two Josephson relations. And where does Shapiro step come? Well, if we also subject this junction to an external RF frequency, a microwave or megahertz or some AC, AC signal, uh, then uh, this curve, step and out, which is also here, step and out, is transformed. It, it can look very crazy. It can look like a staircase of uh, these Shapiro steps. And so they have vertical parts along which voltage does not change. So you increase current and voltage does not change. And then jump to the next one and jump to the next one and jump uh, a staircase of steps. Um, so the difference between steps and voltage is given by this fundamental relationship, which is called Josephson frequency. I don't know if you all, if you all can see it, but it's 2E over H, fundamental constants, times the voltage. And so if you apply um, <laughs> a frequency, a certain frequency to the junction, then voltages at which these steps will appear are integer multiples of this frequency, basically. So the, 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 free, the, the distance between steps is defined by the frequency you apply. Um, this is my data from my PhD thesis um, on um, an SFS Josephson junction. And, you can see the signal here is very small, nanovolts. Um, so these are tiny. Some of the ones I will show you today are um, sort of more in the microvolt regime. Uh, that's the kind of scale here. And uh, the different curves here are different amplitudes of AC drive. So you can see for zero amplitude, no AC drive, we are on this curve. So we we'll go up and then we switch to finite voltage state. And then the more we drive, the more steps develop until there is this entire staircase. Okay, so where does this come from? Uh, the, the physics of it is really just a couple equations. Uh, th this famous textbook by Michael Tinkham on superconductivity uh, dedicates a page and a half to Shapiro steps explaining what they are. And this is only one of the regimes, but it's a very simple formula. That's what I'm, maybe we're not gonna go through the whole derivation uh, on a whiteboard or anything, but I just want you to, to see that we assume a, um, in this case, it's a volt, AC voltage, but it could also be AC current, just cannot solve it analytically, have to solve it numerically, but it's just an, a DC part plus AC part. And then you plug it into the Josephson relation so you see that the phase difference that used to be phi in my previous slide, but in this textbook, it's um, there is this gamma. Um, and so it, ha it has this part. And then we have to plug it into this first Josephson relationship. So we have a sine of a sine because uh, 
phase evolves as a function of sign from the first, second Josephson relationship by the derivative, and then uh, we have to plug it into the sine function. So there is a sine of a sine, which is a Bessel function. And so there's a bunch of Bessel functions times these terms, and they average, if you integrate, they average to some constant. Um, and so you get out of this, uh, these specific voltages at which current spikes in this case. So, um, the dependence looks very peculiar. It's not steps. It's actually just going up and down at uh, jo at, at the Josephson frequencies, um, at the Josephson voltages. But um, the idea is this: so you 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 take the second Josephson relationship, plug it into the first Josephson relationship, and voila, you get these steps. There's a couple lines of derivation. So again, don't want to don't want you to really go through it, but just sort of see that it's simple. And uh, anybody know what they're used for, Shapiro steps? Is it like determining A or something in the new? De uh, determining A? Oh, A, like um, the elementary constant. Oh, alpha, the alpha, the, 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 the fine constant? Yeah. Maybe. I think this uses it for uh, voltage. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Yes. So. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. I had another slide before. Oh, I have a couple of slides before that. Yes, I, I will show you the NIST uh, uh, picture later. So uh, this this slide shows you Bessel functions and also introduces you to how these data are often plotted. Okay, so it's a long uh, introduction to some of the less uh, kosher papers, let's say, <laughs> that I'm going to show you. But uh, but uh, okay, at least you will learn Shapiro steps. Out. So uh, this is data I already showed you. And then here I plot for different number steps, zero step, first step, second step, their amplitudes as a function of this drive power. So as a function of this amplitude, uh, I go and I measure how big are these uh, steps. And so you can see the first one, the critical, the first one is I zero. So it's really just a supercurrent. And as I increase power, it shrinks. So this is the shrinking part. And then it starts to oscillate. And the second one would be uh, this one. And you can see that it grows and then it actually grows and then it also oscillates. So these are functions that are similar to Bessel functions. And this is another way to see it. Uh, black is zero voltage state here, and uh, red and blue are some differential resistance, uh, DVDI, so it's a derivative of this curve. It's a very different junction, so these are just examples. Uh, so that you can see the, the zero envelope is shrinking as you increase power, microwave power is increased and uh, the zero one is shrinking, then zero reappears and then reappears again. So that's the zeroth order Bessel function. The first order Bessel function, it, it grows and then shrinks and then grows again. So this is, if we just map these amplitudes, this will be something like the first order Bessel function, second order Bessel function, third, fourth. And so they, if I make a cut here, all of the black regions will be vertical steps in the curve. And so another way that people like to plot it, especially mo in modern experiments, is these histograms. It's a bit of a crazy representation, but what it is, is it's, it's the same data. It's the same data, but uh, it's been processed so that for each column, we bin data by voltage, okay? By voltage that uh, develops. And so, um, in this step, the derivative of voltage is zero, which means that the voltage is a, some kind of fixed number. One number, another number, another number, another number. And so uh, we just count how many pixels here correspond to this number. So this just basically tells you how many black uh, data points are at each voltage. And so you can see them lining up as straight lines, so if, um, because it's also normalized to a voltage. Um, by by Josephson by Josephson voltage. So this is all done at a fixed frequency for different power, and you can see this is at zero voltage. The supercurrent emerges, 
then the first Shapiro step, the second one, the third, and the fourth, a little bit the fifth, and then they start to beat and interplay, and this is the Bessel function. So the people like to show these histograms a lot because you can see uh, the flat lines of Shapiro steps. Okay, and now <clears throat> this is an um, intuitive way to understand why this is happening. Um, if you know uh, dynamics, uh, nonlinear dynamics, then this is a phase locking phenomenon. This is what Shapiro steps are. If these words don't tell you much, uh, I'm going to explain. So the, when we write down the Josephson relationship for a junction that has resistance, capacitance, um, some Josephson energy, um, we get an equation like this, and this is a bias current. We get an equation like this with all the terms. And uh, because of the uh, second Josephson relationship, then um, current flowing through the, in a normal state with resistance is corresponds to derivative of um, phase. So it's dV, uh, uh, d phi dt is V voltage. So this is just voltage divided by resistance term. Ohm's law. This is Ohm's law. And this is the capacitive term. Um, so that's dQ dt. And that happens to be the second derivative of phase. So as a function of phase, we have this equation and uh, there is this mechanical analogy where phase is like a particle that travels in this kind of potential, which is nicknamed tilted washboard potential. So when we are in the supercurrent state, this particle is trapped inside one of these wells and therefore it doesn't roll. And when it doesn't roll, it doesn't move. There is no time dependence and there is no voltage. So there's a zero voltage state. So it's stuck in one well. And then if we tip the well by increasing bias, we reach the critical current, the well becomes flat and the particle rolls out and starts to roll. There is a change in phase with time. That means voltage. And we start to measure finite voltage. Okay. So now what happens when we add AC bias? We shake the potential like this. We shake the, the washboard. And we can knock the particle out from one well into the other, into the other, into the other, if it's on resonance, right? If the, the curvature of this well matches the, the frequency or the, the, the speed at which the particle moves corresponds to every time it comes up, we push it over to the next well. And that's the phase locking phenomenon. So it happens, uh, manifests in such a way that in a, in a range of biases, it doesn't matter what the tilt is, it always skips one well per period. That's the first Shapiro step. And if it skips two wells per period, that's the second Shapiro step. If it skips three wells, that's the third Shapiro step. And so it depends on the, how strongly you tilt it. That's the physics of this phase locking. Okay, so it's it has a perfect analogy to a classical nonlinear dynamics phenomenon, right? So we, we took the, a quantum equation and completely just killed all the quantum in it. And we can think about this ball that runs down. That's all. So then the, the idea is that maybe the, which steps show up, which steps don't tell us something about this potential. So this is a new idea people got. And now already mentioned uh, NIST. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, the effect is actually useful in reality. You can build or even buy a, a machine that uses this phase locking because we can tell the frequency very precisely. With metrological accuracy, we can control the frequency. Uh, then we know that for each frequency, we know what voltage there should be across the Josephson junction. And so this can be used as a voltage standard with metrological accuracy, right? So this is a useful phenomenon, very legit, very much legit, developed since the 1960s. And there's no controversy about Shapiro steps themselves, that they exist, that they manifest. And there is a very accurate phenomenon that goes straight to that H, to that E, to the fundamental constants. 
and it's actually part of the metrological triangle with uh, resistance, current, and voltage standards. Okay, so now uh, let me take you back in time, although compared to Shapiro stems themselves, this is moving forward, but this is a, a time when I was a grad student and um, we were looking at some effects that are making this Josephson uh, relation stuff a little more interesting. And this will also connect to even more modern topics like Majorana, topological superconductors and things like that as we go on. But um, here is an equation that is a modification of Josephson's equation um, at the top here, which um, expands this sign relationship to higher orders. So what if um, it wasn't a perfect sinusoidal junction, but it had other harmonics here, the second order Josephson effect, which would be interesting because this is uh, two electrons tunneling at the same time, which is already very bizarre because why would they do that? They electrons should tunnel one at a time, in which case there'll be no Josephson effect. It will be so weak. Uh, that we would never see, it, right? So it really requires two electrons tunneling at the same time to have this sinusoidal relationship. But beyond that, there could be other terms like this, where it's more like four electrons tunneling at the same time. So that's less likely. So this, we expect this amplitude to be smaller than this. But could we look for it? Could we try to find it? And uh, one place to look, which you would all agree is a reasonable idea is when this amplitude somehow is canceled, goes to zero, then maybe the second order term, the first order term is zero, the second order term starts to pop up, dominate above, becomes the leading term, and then we can find it. So what would happen well, I already give up the answer, <laughs> but if you, if you had a junction with this current phase relation, then you would have uh, different Shapiro steps. So remember, it's metrological, right? So we can really relate the frequency to the voltage very accurately. And so certainly by a factor of two, we're not going to be wrong unless we, unless we just made a mistake in the reading of the, all the multipliers of our circuit, etc. So we, we should be able to tell that, that the Shapiro step, so we had Shapiro steps in between appearing at half the frequencies, at half the voltages. And so uh, we're gonna look at this physical review paper, which is a very nice paper uh, from the time, yeah, when I was in grad school, but this is from uh, France, from uh, Grenoble, and uh, a very nice group of researchers that studied exactly the, the regime where this uh, term cancels. So it happens at the zero pi uh, crossover, which basically means that this value IC goes from positive to negative and it goes through zero. And so that's a good spot to look for higher order terms. So what they show here is indeed um, as a function of a parameter, which is in this case temperature, they measure the Josephson effect, the maximum supercurrent flowing, the critical current. And they see that as they cool down the sample, uh, it goes down pretty close to zero and then it turns around. So what really happens is it crosses through. It goes from positive to negative, but this measurement is not sensitive to sign. And so it flips it over, so it makes it like a bird. And so for this device with a thickness of the barrier of 19 nanometers, and this is a ferromagnetic barrier that makes it, make it do that, um, it goes very close to zero. But then for a different junction that they made, SFS junction, you can see it goes to zero for 17 nanometers and it um, has a non-zero part here and then it turns around. So, aha. Uh -huh. Let's look at Shapiro steps at this point, right? So this is what this data is. So the same junction, 17 nanometers. You can see big steps, and this already normalized by Josephson frequency. So that's often done. It's very convenient. Uh, we trust that people can do that correctly. 
And so there is a big steps at one, which changes with power, grows with power. There is a step at two that grows with power slowly, slower, because that sec second order Bessel function ramps on slower. So this is all very reasonable. And in between little, little steps at one half and at three halves. And this happens, let's see the temperatures at which it happens. Um, oh, sorry, this was not power, this is temperature. So I shouldn't talk about the. Okay, they also do power in this paper. Um, okay, so where it happens is 112 Kelvin. So it's just off of one, so right here. Right at this point, another step. Up. So, uh, of course, if it is a sine 2 phi junction, you also expect the regular steps at 1 and 2, because that's that'll be the second order step for a sine 2 phi junction. So you expect all of these steps and also steps in between. So, um, yes, it's a very nice paper, and uh, it's, uh, what else could it be? Right? So we, we're looking for this term. There is steps appearing at half the frequency, right at the point where they're supposed to appear. And there is evidence from this DC measurement that there is some kind of supercurrent non-vanishing at the transition. Um, so what do we think? A pretty good paper. Okay, it actually is a good paper. It, 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 I, you know, I, don't, I don't actually think there's anything wrong with this paper. And they're not claiming anything crazy, still... they just say they see a half. Well, no, they say we interpret it as a second order Josephson effect. Oh. Um, they, they do say that. And, okay. and yes, you're right. I mean, you, they could be extremely careful and say, for instance, oh, this is a second order, well, this is a half integer Shapiro steps. They appear at this point. Our preferred interpretation is this. There could be other possibilities. We think it's this one because blah, 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 right? They don't do that. So that's maybe a, a minus sign. But um, other than that, you know, it's a lot of nice data. And uh, yeah, um, seriously, this is, this is an example of a good paper. I'm not tricking you. Um, however, <laughs> however, uh, there is an alternative explanation to the whole thing. Even though they've measured from two different ways, the missing Shapiro, uh, half integer Shapiro steps and the, the non-vanishing supercurrent. Uh, in uh, my PhD, I saw something similar, but I also measured a third thing on those junctions which was in contradiction with the other two, okay? So here's my data, um, a very similar junction, also zero pi superconductor ferromagnet. Uh, here is a half Shapiro step. There is also one, 1. 1.5 one. This is the, with no power, it looks like a supercurrent switching. Uh, this is a very low frequency compared to what we do now. With semiconductors, we go to, um, gigahertz and this was uh i had a, this pico voltmeter i could measure tiny voltages with it and yeah so uh there is also as a function of temperature this transition where the zero order step the critical current it doesn't vanish it reaches a low point and then goes up and the half integer step kind of lives around here doesn't live outside of this 60 millikelvin window around the pi. And this is also what they saw. <coughs> but another thing that um, I measured was um, um, a so-called diffraction pattern of supercurrent. So um, let me tell you what the other explanation is, and then we'll look at some data. So one explanation is this, we already went through this. So the Josephson junction has this sine two phi component. So here's a sine in blue and sine two phi in uh, red. And if you um, go towards the, the special temperature in this case, the parameter, then uh, the blue one diminishes and the red one is roughly the same. 
And so you start to pick up the red one. Um, here is another thing that can happen. Um, it's a non-uniform system, so non-ideal. Less ideal than you might think. Right? That's, an, that's a common theme. So I, I, I told you I will flag common themes in some of the research. And so you, you can assume that your sample is exactly what you made, but maybe it has some imperfection that you haven't thought about. And so this is what we're considering. And so um, parts of this system already have uh, transitioned into the negative supercurrent state, which is a pi junction, and parts are still beyond. So parts are still on the positive side and parts are on the negative side because of the slightly different thickness. And because there is this positive negative, uh, the wave function becomes frustrated and because if you go around the loop uh, in quantum mechanics, any wave function needs to make a, a phase of two pi. And so if there is positive and negative coupling, it needs to, um, it is missing a pi. Because these two wave functions will have a negative sign between them, so they are different by pi. And these two are with the same sign. And so if you go around the loop, you have a problem because you picked up a pi and you need another pi. And what you can do is flow some current around here locally, like a little vortex inside the junction. And if you have another boundary, there could be another vortex here. And there's been work now going back in time from the 1980s where they showed that these kind of half flux quantum vortices can phase lock to microwave at half the frequency. Amazing. So yeah, so my paper is all about that. And uh, so the, um, so this is a large scale uh, plot here, but uh, basically uh, we had a model where we exactly calculate what kind of non-uniformity there will be. The barrier here will be 11 nanometers and here 10.4, which is, super tiny difference, not even physical. So it's probably some diffusion of magnetic atoms into the superconductor, that's the real explanation. But, and this will be like a micron and this will be nine microns basically. And, and so for this kind of little difference, little step in, in properties, uh, what we've, what is it? this is a simulation, this is a measurement, um, becomes really unusual because for a standard uniform Josephson junction with everything uniform, uh, if you apply magnetic field to it, you get this beautiful Fraunhofer effect. Have anyone seen that in any papers, research? Uh, so that's a very common thing, but there is another analogy between optics and supercurrents, where um, supercurrent flowing through the junction is like light coming through a diffraction slit. And when it's completely uniform, it's a perfect Fraunhofer diffraction that happens as a function of applied flux to this loop. And that's also in Tinkum. So I could show you another page from Tinkum where this is explained, but for the sake of time, just believe me. So when, when it looks really Fraunhoferish, so one big central peak and then a smaller lobe and smaller, uh, that's a very uniform junction. So away from the pi point, it's uniform and then at the pi junction point, it develops a dip. So it becomes a dip. Uh, and what that means is that uh, half of the supercurrent uh, is phase shifted by pi. So if you remember your optics, if you block a slit with a pi plate, but only half of the slit, you will have an interference minimum in the middle. So half of the light goes through a pi shifted region and half of the light goes through uh, without any phase shift. And so in the middle, they interfere destructively. So you get a minimum in the middle. And this is what happens. So this is evidence that it's a non-uniform junction and you, you fit it to this model and you get a pretty good agreement between simulation and, <coughs> and data. So we learned something extra about our junctions that we made in our collaboration. So not the French people, they made their own junctions um, and you know what? They did not show these curves in their PRL. So at the time we didn't know, is it, is it, is it also showing this? So would this be an explanation for their effects or did they always have perfect patterns like this? So we asked them at some point, I don't remember 
during this or later, because I've met them many times. And they said, oh yeah, it looked like a perfect uh, Fraunhofer pattern. So I guess this wasn't their, this wasn't their case. So this is just a, perhaps this is just a case or this is an alternative explanation to a beautiful coincidence that could really strongly point in one direction towards sine to phi. And maybe that's what they really found. But then we measured the same thing, but arrive to a different conclusion, completely different. Right? And it's not one measurement, I emphasize. It was two different measurements, right? The, the non-vanishing supercurrent and the appearance of Shapiro steps. And this is a third measurement. So yeah, so this is um, just a paper from the 1988 from uh, IBM where they made a, a loop, they put intentionally half a flux quantum through it, uh, and they've uh, observed half integer Shapiro steps. Uh, so we can see, uh, you can actually, if you look at it enough, you will recognize them because they're kind of irregular. So integer steps are regular, but there are extra little steps in between that are, uh, look like they're not supposed to be there because they follow a different set of Bessel functions. Okay, so um, I was eight years old when this paper came out. And of course I haven't read it <laughs> when it came out, uh, but my PhD advisor had. He was already a professor and had his own group. And of course he was working on squids and Delvin Harlingen is his name. And uh, he knew this very well and maybe some other works. So for him, when he sees a paper that says, oh, half integer Shapiro steps must be sine to phi, his first reaction is, wait a minute, there are other ways to get half integer Shapiro steps. I know this because I'm a professor for 20 years and I've seen this before. So we we'll go back to that and uh, Turns out our, our samples, our junctions were something very similar to this, different geometry, but the idea was this. So this is really how it looks. So if you plot, uh, now I told you it's a non-uniform system where part is um, pi, part is zero. Um, now let's simplify it and say it's two junctions with a loop. And one is kind of negative, one is positive. And that is equivalent to two normal standard junctions, both sinusoidal and a half a flux quantum in there that generates a current flowing around. And so when there is no half a flux quantum, then as a function of phases across the two junctions, the potential looks like this. And when you shake it, this is the tilted board board potential. When you shake it, you just hop between these minima. But if there is this frustration, half a flux quantum, there is a double set. And so extra minima appear. And you can hop like this, and this is the half integer effect. So you phase lock to half the, the period. So this is what they found in 1988. But these are simulations by, by us. <coughs> okay. So the, the plot thickens with this stuff, I'm gonna carry you quite a while here. So uh, we, we later actually did see uh, the real sign to phi, we believe, in these junctions. And it looked, uh, looked like this. So again, half integer Shapiro steps, let's start from this end. So 0.5, there's some steps. Non-vanishing critical current. So we repeated uh, the French paper from 2024. Actually, this was published in 2018, but the data is from, I don't know, 2006, somehow, somehow no. um, uh, it's a separate story. Now, this is what the, the patterns look like. So you don't see a, a dip anywhere, right? You don't see a minimum. No. So there isn't a, the junctions are uniform in this case. So it changed a little bit the fabrication of the junction, so it became uniform. And so there isn't a, a destructive interference dip. There is no half vortices generated that can phase lock 
and generate these two dependencies, right? But there is also something else here that wasn't seen before. Can you can you spot it in these patterns? King. Yeah, there is a king in the experiment, and in the simulation, it's more dramatic. So there is a second period. So of course, if the sine two phi effect is strong, it also manifests in these patterns, and this is how they should look. They shouldn't look Fraunhofer, or they should look like a Fraunhofer with one period plus Fraunhofer with half a period, right? But the French people told us that it looks just like normal Fraunhofer. So what's up with that? So I don't know, actually, because, you know, those samples were, of course, long gone. And uh, I actually looked in the PhD thesis of Armand Serrier, who is now his own professor in France, and uh, there are some diffraction patterns in the thesis. So they, they did not include them in the PRL, but they did have more data, and they did show it in the thesis. So in principle, it's available. We can find it. That's why I'd say it's a good, it's a good experiment with uh, all the things done properly, just not everything is in the paper. Right. So that's maybe the only criticism. Okay, so this is uh, this is another um, sine phi plus sine to phi junction that we think we measured. This is now in my own group in Pittsburgh. So this is from literally on archive uh, this year or last year. Again, we have a kink. So this is a this would be a Fraunhofer pattern, but then there's extra features. You can also kind of imagine that maybe this one is kind of skewed and kinked. It's not a perfect Fraunhofer would have just like normal, but this is of course a weaker, smaller dependence. And if we put in a sine phi and sine two phi in a model, yeah, indeed what that's what we get for different ratios. So for no sine two phi, it's the red, the Fraunhofer pattern. For uh, a lot of sine two phi, there is a two periods. And for intermediate, it's kind of a slated Dependence here, so um, maybe it's been measured. But there is another explanation. Are you still keeping track? Uh, there is another explanation, which we, we, we did explain it in the paper. There are, there are actually technically three explanations, but the, here is another explanation. So. This is this diffraction analogy, right? It's diffraction analogy. Um, so it's different slits um, interfering. So sine to phi will be like a, a light of different frequency, I guess, coming down, but uh, I'm not sure. But here, so what we noticed here is in the picture of the junction, and this is a very different junction. This is a junction actually made at UCSB, uh, at least part of it. We put down a nanowire a semiconductor nanowire on a quantum well and then deposited a superconductor on top. So underneath this nanowire, there was a junction, but we etched parts left and right of it. So supercurrent can flow from top to bottom, but not around here. And where the junction is, is underneath the nanowire, there is no superconductor. So we call it smash junction. And you can read the paper already. Um, we noticed that in these uh, samples, there was an artifact due to cross-linking of um, resist, this dark stripe running through. And that was because we double wrote the middle just to make sure that all the parts of the structure connect. So that was done in the clean room in Pittsburgh. Um, we don't know if this is a significant effect or not. We don't know, but if you think about interference of light through a system that is more transmissive and less transmissive, it kind of becomes like a diffraction grating with uh, three segments or with two segments and one barrier, let's say, or how you want to do it. And if you remember diffraction gratings from physics two, the more periods to the grating, the more little bumps before you have another big bump. Right. So if you have three, then there'll be one little bump, one big bump. So this is a non-uniform model for different levels of current here and here. So this is a sinusoidal junction. There is no sine to phi here. It's just as a function of position. 
there is different levels of current. So again, less ideal junction than you hope or you think or you assume. Less ideal sample gives you this uh, behavior exactly like the exotic effect that you expect. Right. So um, this is the sine two phi part of the talk. Then we're going to talk about fractional Jolison effect, which is a Majorana one. Um, any thoughts or questions here? By the way, for this experiment, if you go on the archive, uh, I told you we're doing three measurements, right? The critical current as a function of some parameter, Shapiro steps, and uh, this diffraction pattern. We did a third one with a squid, a fourth one. And so the fourth one is most definitive. And then if all four point and sign to phi, then I guess it's sign to phi. Right? So in this case, it's so hard to prove. Not from one, not from two, not from three, because even the third one you can explain in a different way. But from four different measurements, we finally say, okay. But we do discuss this alternative possibility as well. So before we move on, I'm going to take a little break or about any thoughts? What I was thinking. So this, um, this first example, um, like I said, it's it's all good, reliable research. It's genuinely hard. Uh, I pointed out some moments where, for instance, if you had 20 years of experience, you could be more skeptical, and then it could lead you in a slightly different direction. But everybody done good work. Everybody measured everything they had to measure. Maybe didn't show everything in the paper, but this is a part of culture. You know, you have this is what the paper is, right? It's a, it's a four pages with three or four figures, and you just select something there which you think illustrates your claim the best way. Right? And, and another person might want to see something else, like a diffraction pattern. And if that person is your referee, then you may be forced to add it to the paper. If they're not your referee, then you may, you may not show it. And I think that's exactly what happens. So this is a traditional good paper, but still look how complicated it can be. And you, you can, you know, you can call me paranoid. You know, always not trusting your own eyes. Like, look, this, you got it, right? You got it. But maybe not. Maybe it's, maybe that gray stripe makes it non-uniform again, right? So because I, as a grad student, I experienced it. I, I didn't want to write this paper until we check out all the, all the, all these things. So it took, took quite some time. Okay. A little different physics, but still Josephson junctions, still Shapiro steps, still harmonics, but now it's in the other direction. So here is a, um, a one-dimensional Josephson junction. So it's a nanowire and a superconductor contacting here and here. And the idea is that maybe, just maybe, there are these exotic Majorana particles denoted by stars at each end. So here, 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 here. And the interaction of these inner ones across the Josephson barrier is predicted theoretically to create fractional Josephson effect, which is very strange. So for instance, when I was in grad school, there was a review of modern physics, right? Is that a good journal? Yeah, it's yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. And so, th but that review of modern physics that uh, was dedicated to Josephson relations uh, that came out during my PhD, it said that this is impossible. That Josephson effect should be uh, uh, multiples of uh, phi, like phi, two phi, three phi, four phi is all allowed. But half, no. But this is what we really have here. We have a Josephson relation that is well, it's a sinusoidal, possibly, but this is two pi. So the full period is four pi. The full period is double. What it means, remember I said the standard one is two electrons tunneling. This is like one electron tunneling, but carrying supercurrent. 
So this is the bizarre thing about Majorana fermions is that by adding one electron to a superconductor, you um, still keep the same energy. So this is, this is the, the weird property of Majorana. And um, it comes from uh, canceled interaction between these uh, two Majoranas when the phase is exactly pi. So normally there is an anti-crossing here between the green and the black branch which makes it a two pi periodic relation, but here it's uh, canceled, it's protected by topology. Okay, my talk is not about that today. <clears throat> I talk about the fact, so what kind of Shapiro steps do we expect here? So I told you if it's sine to phi, then new steps appear at half the frequency, right? So if it's sine four pi, uh, sine phi over two, sorry. Four pi is sine phi over two. Yeah, so this one is a double frequency. So yeah, so some steps should disappear. The step at one, at three, at five, they should be gone. The step should be at two, at four, at six, at double the frequency, at double the voltage. And so we go in the other direction. And this is a, this is a very big deal. Yes, this whole Majorana business is very popular, and uh, this is one of the ways that you can confirm, verify that you have them in your junction. So this, this effect comes up very often in these papers, in these discussions. And uh, I told you our own work was back in 2012, and that was a tunneling measurement, not a Josephson effect. It was a zero bias peak business. Um, but... In, um, there was another experiment at the same, during the same time, which uh, measured this. So there is, of course, also theory. So this is a theoretical paper from the same year, 2012. And uh, they've simulated the sine phi over two junction. And what we have here is double the frequencies, very strong steps. Uh, but then, okay, under certain circumstances, they say that also the regular steps do appear. For instance, if there is another channel through which uh, two electrons can hop, maybe it's not a perfect system. But then what you look at is the amplitude, so the, the double steps are larger and the other ones are smaller or, or something like this. So, you know. The theory is cerebral technology. It could be more complicated, but maybe from this measurement you can fish something out and, and make a conclusion about uh, about Majorana's present in the system. So this is uh, um, the last 10 years. And uh, the experiment I mentioned is this one. is from 2012 from Purdue University. And uh, so what the title says, a fractional Joseph, AC Josephson effect in a superconductor semiconductor nanowire as a signature of Majorana particles. Now, when this paper came out, um, I was quite a few years out of my PhD, uh, finishing my postdoc, and I already had that experience from my PhD with Shapiro steps, so I felt like I'm one of the Shapiro guys, experts. Uh, but when I saw this paper, I said, no way. Right. So this is an example of paper that I disagree with strongly and disagreed pretty much when it came out. Um, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you why and I'll show you why. So this is a, this is a different, this is a different discussion now. Let's put it this way. Um, so what the paper shows is uh, Shapiro steps, uh, different colors are different powers. So remember Bessel functions, some steps grow, some steps shrink. Um, and this is different magnetic fields. And why they are showing different fields is because one important ingredient in this Majorana recipe is broken spin symmetry and uh, you need to apply a, a large field. And it, it's not known at the time, it's 2012, what the field should be. Our experiment was 100 millitesla when some signatures appeared, and this experiment is about two tesla, but okay, um, fine. It's different steps, different different samples, different signatures. Um, this is the missing step. 
So there should be a step here at one. This is the uh, corresponds to one. And it kind of shrinks and then it's gone. And then it's gone. So the step at two is here. Interestingly, the step at three is also here. And some of all the other higher steps are do show up. So let's look at this data a little bit uh, closely. Let's look at the theory again. So the steps are very sharp and okay, this is a simulation. Maybe we don't expect such sharpness, but I did show you data where it was also pretty sharp, right? For other, for other samples. So these steps are kind of rounded and they are sharper at low fields, but then I guess the overall current also shrinks and um, it's all just becomes little wiggles, not really dramatic resonances, metrological, right? Uh, accuracy that they use at NIST. Uh, they are uh, quite a bit, um, quite a bit uh, around it. So maybe if we take a derivative, we will see them better. Uh, but um, the first thought I had was maybe there's some structure underneath in this curve that right at this point, there is a kind of a nonlinearity in the curve that smoothens it out and makes the step disappear. So that's one possibility I was thinking about, that, that these are uh, kind of weaker and weaker signals and you, you start to read into them maybe more than you should. So just because at a finite field, something that you kind of expect happens and it's complicated, the second one is still here, this one, right? Doesn't mean that you've observed the fractional AC Josephson effect, which is a very strong signature of a very exotic sought after uh, Majorana effect in this case. And also who knows what other samples show? Uh, is it reproducible? Is it uh, you know, dependent on anything? Uh, so, um, yeah, um, sure enough, um, it is possible to make the first step disappear without any Majoranas in similar junctions. So here is a superconductor semiconductor junction. This is from NYU. And this is a recent paper, but uh, I think something like this was seen even earlier, but um, yeah, let's look at these data. Basically you have um, at low power, um, negative dB, uh, just a Jolison curve. And then um, it kind of skips to the second step in the green and the orange, and eventually it does appear. Here's another example where um, there is a first step for a different frequency. So 11 gigahertz versus seven. So it's frequency dependent. And in histogram form, uh, we're looking at, remember, uh, all the steps bin into certain lines of fixed voltage. Uh, and so here we have at one, there is no step. Here at one, there is a step. So you can uh, take a trivial junction. This is a zero magnetic field, so there cannot be any Majoranas. And you can make uh, a step disappear, at least partially disappear. Um, and the explanation they give here is some Landau Zener physics, but I think it could be even simpler. So for instance, this is another paper from a metallic junction where, again, you, you recognize all these beating vessel functions. Uh, what you need to look at is where is the first one? So to look at the traces, maybe it's easier. You can see here it jumps across the first line to the second. Um, it can also jump through more lines. Um, and this is how it looks as a function of power. Basically, the supercurrent goes down and uh, the, Bessel, the first Bessel function is appearing here. But in this regime, it goes straight to second or even higher uh, resonance. So the explanation here is overheating of the junction. So we go from missing Shapiro steps being evidence of new type of superconductivity topological superconductivity with Majorana fermions to, well, it can also happen when the junction gets overheated. And so what happens when the junction gets overheated, uh, remember, 
it switches from supercurrent state into finite voltage state. And so it switches so far that it skips the voltages for the first few steps and starts rolling or locking onto one of the higher steps. So this is what this is what this basically means. Okay. So there are these um, experiments, right? No Majorana, the first step is missing. Um, a couple I showed you. We've also seen something like this in our work. And another thing about that uh, 2012 paper uh, that I want to say is that, uh, you know, the system was really not in the, not expected to be in the Majorana regime. It says nanowire, but in reality, the sample was an array of wires etched out of a quantum well. So it's very complicated. Imagine I showed you that in a, in a squid with two junctions, so let's say two wires with a flux quantum, there was phase locking to some exotic Shapiro steps. Uh, so now imagine it's an array of multiple wires uh, doing this. Then if you think about Majorana's, there would have to be a Majorana mode at each junction to make such a dramatic effect. So in this sample, a controlling claim to control I don't know, 10, 20 Majorana modes. I don't remember how many wires there were. It's just very hard to imagine. Um, even just one wire and two superconducting segments is beyond the state of the art even today to claim anything related to Majorana because you have to control two segments and make them both topological and then couple them together. So this effect is, I expect it to be very, very difficult to demonstrate. So this is another principle here. So again, maybe as an expert, I know that this effect should be really hard to show and you have to be able to control two sides of the junction separately and uh, you know figure out all the parameters and do a bunch of measurements show a lot of data and when i see just a little bit of data on this kind of ad hoc sample i just say this is very unlikely to be what it claims to be so going back to my experience here is the, is the first Shapiro step missing enough, or should it be like all the odd steps missing? Ah, great question, yeah. So first of all, I will show you now another result, but also, first, what also tends to happen in these situations, and it also happened with our paper, is that um, you show something, and then you say, well, maybe it's uh, Majorana, and then there is, uh, shortly after a theory paper that says, oh yeah, sure, under certain assumptions, uh, absolutely, just the first step should be missing. The first step is the easiest one to go missing. And it's related to, in that specific paper I'm talking about, to Landau Zimmer transitions. Basically, this means a higher frequency and uh, at higher frequency, there'll be a chance to couple through that uh, anti-crossing and go up on a different Josephson branch, if you can follow what I'm saying. Um, but the, the essence is that um, these systems are so rich that um, you can find a striking pattern. And then even if it has some things that are inconsistent with a simple theory, you can create a new theory add some elements and it will explain what you measure right we got I, i'm hoping to talk next week about this connection between theory and experiment as a separate sort of discussion point like how theory can be used to reinforce experiment the theory that's done before or after can be used right so this is this is an example of a theory that came i think simultaneous or a little bit after it's a very simple theory. Just throw in, do that calculation from Tinkum basically, but throw in the sine phi over two in the model and then add some other things. So it's a nothing wrong with this theory under the assumptions that it's made, right? But then, yeah, I think even in this theory, you can, I think, see that the first step is missing. Like for instance here, I don't know, maybe not. I'm not going to claim that the first step is more missing than others, but 
Um, right, but but then of course uh, this paper was actually criticized uh, uh, right off the bat when it appeared. Then us experts said, "Well, this can be anything. I don't know. The sample is not quite right, and you know you're not showing much data, and you it could be just fine tuning to this resonance." So, of course, if the first is missing, the third is missing, the fifth is missing, a whole chain of them missing now. That, that should be more convincing, right? So this, is, this also happened. It's a different system. It's Mercury-Telluride Junction, quantum spin hole, and uh, work from uh, Germany and uh, Japan. Uh, and this, these are histograms you're already familiar with. Uh, it's a progression of different frequencies. So I already mentioned the frequency is important. At high frequency, everything shows up. The first, the third, and the, the second, and the third, and the fourth. All are the, the peaks in the histogram. Then as you lower frequency with red arrows is marked where steps are missing. So at lower frequency, the first starts to be missing. So going from here to here, this is kind of like that first paper. So they can see just the first one missing at this frequency. Uh, and they say, well, when it's getting more adiabatic and there is no possibility to excite to higher states and relax to the um, uh, sine, sine phi relationship, you can you stay on the sine phi over two, the lower the frequency, the better it gets. And at around the gigahertz, more orders are missing. So the odd ones are missing, and the the two, the four, the six, the eight are there. That's pretty dramatic. A clear improvement on the the first work. I think this is a, a couple of years later, maybe 2016. Completely different system, completely different group, um, but certainly took in that criticism. Oh. You just show one step missing, and it could be anything. And here's other explanations. And I mean, what else could this be? This must be the you know they call it gapless states, but this is a fractional Josephson effect. Agree? Wait, you say anything? <laughs> Who is convinced? Who's seen this paper before? Oh, I chose well. <laughs> okay, so let's look at this data. Um, so remember, this is a histogram. By the way, the paper does not show the actual current voltage characteristics or even just the DVDI. It's all these bins. So let's just look at the bins. bins it, it's the same. With the bin, it's the same. Uh, the bins tell us all the information is just kind of uh, uh, non-standard. So let's look at these bins here first. Um, what can we say about these bins? They are, so uh, you know, the six, okay, let me tell you this, 6.6 .6 gigahertz. Each gigahertz is uh, either two or four microvolts if you convert it by H omega divided by E charge. It's uh, about, um, let's say, two or four microvolts. So six gigahertz is a uh, few tens of microvolts. And that's a voltage that's easy to measure. It's a good, strong signal. And now here, this is around a couple microvolts. That's getting hard to measure. So with that information, uh, let's look at these bins or these bins. These are very sharp, tall peaks. Because my guess is this IV curve has very nice and clear, easy to see steps because of the large frequency used here, right? Kind of like this um, work from uh, NYU where we can see with our own eyes the steps um, are flat in between and we have very sharp histograms with a lot more resolution and we can see how sharp they are. So I think this is the case here. Now, going this way, what do we see? Going to lower frequency. 
we see uh, the histograms are broadened. Right? So this is more of a situation where it's a curve with little wiggling. And if we dif differentiate it, there'll be some regions with slower changing voltage and faster changing voltage and slower changing voltage, right? So this is, so pushing it before you push it a little further, you stop resolving anything. It just becomes one blob. Um, and nevertheless, yeah, so there they, they show this curve and they show the kind of the frequency dependence of, uh, of missing steps. Well, here's our work where um, something similar happens. The first one is missing, the third one is missing, the fifth one is missing. And this situation we have a completely trivial junction. No Majoranas, again, a superconductor semiconductor system at zero field, no Majoranas. I'm almost done. Um, Okay, so uh, we can also find other things, like for instance, first and second missing, and the fourth. So we can make the uh, even ones go missing. Now well, what's expected is the odd ones missing. So the one, three, five. Uh, we can also make in the same junction, uh, half steps appear. Remember half steps from the first part of the lecture? Oh, well, here they are. So all in the same junction. We can make whatever you want and uh, also, these are kind of blurry, right? So this is again, lower frequency. And we have a model. So this is an experiment, this is a model. We have a model for it. So when, if we assume that there are some resonances underlying, like I told you, uh, it's a mesoscopic junction. So the IV trace, even without any microwave on, doesn't have to be in like an Ohm's law or a standard Josephson relation. There could be some other things like multiple and grave reflections and other resonances and uh, as we go through these resonances we can make some steps suppressed and some steps enhanced and by the position of the resonances we can choose what we want so here's a histogram with the first third fifth dimmed and second four six eight etc brighter now this is a zero temperature perfect model and so if you assume some broadening you can imagine these will be completely gone and only the even ones will remain. So just add the broadening to the model and this will happen. Um, so let's think about this for a moment. Uh, I know we're all tired and it's been a long discussion, but here now I showed you an absolute smoking gun signature of a dramatic effect, Majorana fermions. First, third, fifth, seventh Shapiro step missing. And now I'm showing you that even this can be replicated without any Majorana. So maybe Shapiro steps is just unlucky. It's sort of uh, always another explanation, always another possibility. Uh, yes and no, right? Um, first of all, they're, I don't think they're uniquely unlucky. Uh, in whatever you measure in your labs or whatever I measure in my zero bias peaks or other things, there are other possibilities, other explanations. What I also uh, observe in my work is that my data is so rich with all kinds of features that if I want to find some specific pattern, chances are I will against the odds, right? So I talk to a theory colleague, they say, well, look, you should see this and then it will be 100% uh, legit. And I can just turn around and say, well, here it is. We already have it. Let me just look through the data. Right? There are some good examples with zero bias peaks that I wanna bring up, but I will restrain myself from doing that today, but maybe we can talk about it next week if you, if you come back. Um, Right, so some of these things, you know, um, some of these more recent ones, uh, I could tell on the spot. Like I open the paper and I say, no, it can't be. 
which means that at some point some due diligence was lost, right? Either a referee didn't wasn't the right expert, or you know, a lot of this Majorana um, activity was so exciting that uh, people were trying to find it with who came from different backgrounds. So, for instance, a semiconductor expert would start to look at superconductor devices, or vice versa. My own advisor, Damon Harlingen who told me during my PhD, well, these Shapiro steps could have a different explanation. He wrote his own zero bias peak paper. So he ventured into the semiconductor territory and I disagree with that paper. I think that's wrong. So there was all this mixing. Are we supposed to stop? Are you guys, yeah, are you almost finished up? Yeah, well, okay. we should just completely stop or? Uh, we can check the other room first. Oh, okay. I've been used, oh, okay. Yeah, we had it. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, couple more correct. Minutes. Yeah, a couple yeah, more minutes. Okay. Yeah, so maybe I'll skip some of these things uh, or we can look at them uh, next time. I just wanted to flash this slide and I will, I was going to talk about this next, next week. Uh, but this is uh, summarizing what, um, what you could use uh, to evaluate the paper. And we will focus on this next week. But this is basically what we, the examples I showed you today. Um, you can break down some of the arguments I made to summarize them uh, along these points, right? So uh, basically the simple thing, is there enough data shown? Sometimes it's just clear that, you know, there's more. Maybe the range is too narrow. Or for instance, these Shapiro steps shown only in histogram and not in real view, right? Something like this that you can uh, say, oh, I want to see more, right? Um, these are, you know, um, more, uh, we did not talk about this today, but I will show you some examples uh, next week where it's just too perfect. So it's not too good to be true, which is a slightly different thing, but it's just, uh, you know, it just fits the theory so well or just exactly how you expect it. Uh, this, could, uh, this could be a little bit suspicious if it happens. Uh, this is what we talked about today a lot, right? So it, is, it, is it actually surprising in a kind of a strange way? Like, oh, that's weird that they measured it. I wouldn't expect them to be able to measure this, like this, this missing Shapiro step, right? Um, too good to be true is just a catch-all. Like, do you have a feeling that it's just everything is okay? You cannot see any problem with it, but is it just sort of something is uh, bothering you, right? So... Um, yeah, alternative explanations and uh, maybe you have your own things that you've already developed. So I want you to uh, try to maybe think about this, these two things. So think maybe, there, like I told you about these Shapiro step papers going back 20 years, maybe there is a paper that you are not sure about and uh, you don't have to say it out loud or tell me, but you're also welcome to tell me or say about it in class or send me an email or just think about it saying, okay, there was a paper like this and try to apply these criteria. I'll send you the slides. And also if you have your own, uh, your own criteria, I'll be happy to hear and, and learn from you how, you how you evaluate the papers. And so we'll have, we'll talk about how to, you know, how to make papers more reliable by maybe adding some sections, sharing some data um, we'll look at some more examples of these uh, smoking gun features and uh, too good to be true uh, examples. And if you give me some examples, I'll be happy to try to analyze them for you with my method and see what happens. It'll be kind of an experimental application of this. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it.